This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, from Philadelphia to Erie and from Scranton to Pittsburgh, it's Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenewalt, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, and I'm joined as usual by my co-host, Maura Donnelly, who's on another screen here. Hello, Maura. Hello, Charlie. How are you? All right. Uh, so you are secluded and uh, still locked down. I am. I am well behaved, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you always are, Mara. You always are. So um, uh, we thought that today we would take a look uh, at um, our educational system since it's back to school time and uh, we find that our universities and our colleges around the Commonwealth have gone back uh, to uh, uh, back to uh, session and uh, we're fortunate enough to have Jamie Martin with us who is the newly minted president of APSCUF, the uh, state association of um, uh, the state uh, union that represents all the faculty in the 14 state universities. So Jamie, welcome, welcome to the program again. Thank you, Charlie and Maura. Thanks for having me back. I'm excited to be here. Well, you guys look very, very healthy. You guys don't look like you're in the midst of a plague whatsoever. <laughs> well, like Maura, I'm trying to be well behaved. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jamie, could you give Maura and uh, myself and our viewers some idea of the challenges that uh, are um, being faced now by the, our 14 universities as they try to reconvene for a new school year uh, in the uh, light of this uh, virus that is uh, with us across the Commonwealth. Well, uh, Charlie, I think the last time I was with you, I shared some results of a survey that we had done uh, back yes. in, in July. And so, uh, what we're finding out is the fears that the faculty had are beginning to come to fruition. And, you know, we did talk that uh, the 14 universities are all doing something a little bit different. Some are fully remote, like Westchester and East Stroudsburg. Um, at Millersville, you're having, I think, some face-to-face -face classes, but primarily uh, remote delivery. We do have a number of campuses that decided that they wanted to do primarily face-to-face. -face. And so in universities like Bloomsburg and Kutztown and IUP, uh, Shippensburg have a fairly large number of students that came back to campus. Um, and you know, at, at those universities, the presidents made the decision to bring students back because they said that's what students wanted. They wanted to have an in-person experience. And uh, I'm, I'm a mother, and as parents, my husband and I sometimes had to tell our kids, uh, you can't do that because it's not safe. You know, we had to be the grown-ups in the room. But the, the presidents decided at those universities will bring students back, and we have the authority to do that. And telling the faculty, you have to be in the classroom. And as I said, now uh, the fears we had, which were students won't socially distance off campus and they won't wear masks and they're gonna do the things students have always done for decades, which will be hang out, go to parties. Um, that's happened in a number of universities. And right now at Bloomsburg, for example, they haven't yet finished the second week of classes and there are 89 confirmed cases. Oh my goodness. Um, and they're growing, it seems like, at an exponential rate. So at this point, I'm, 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 I'm rather angry. You know, we, we were trying to sound the alarms that look at what's happening around the country. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And now we're seeing students that are becoming ill. Uh, those students were in classrooms. We don't know to what extent we might have faculty that were exposed. We're, not con we're concerned about testing at some universities and contact tracing. And we're beginning to hear about cases at other universities like Mansfield and Lock Haven and IUP. And now predictably, we're blaming the students, right? Mm -hmm. So the university presidents made those decisions that will bring them back, uh, but now we're blaming the students for behaving like students. And so that's been a, a great concern for us. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that some of those universities are going to say, uh, this is too many cases. Like how many cases are gonna to be too many before we're putting a lot of people um, on the university campus and in the community at large at risk. So we're happy that some of the presidents made decisions to go fully remote um, in the middle of a pandemic and concerned for uh, the students, the staff and faculty at the others uh, where they've made different decisions. Well, how is APSCUP helping the uh, 
professors who have to go back because their president has made that decision. I mean, what kind of support or guidance are, are you providing or, um, you know, helping them with? How are you helping them? Well, we're trying to make sure that uh, there's, an, you know, at those universities, the plans are in place to provide enough uh, masks for, for students and faculty um, and staff and enough cleaning supplies. And that was a problem at some universities that there weren't enough of those. And that social distancing uh, requirements are in place in the classrooms where there are face-to-face -face classes. Uh, so um, at some of the universities, I spoke with colleagues at Shippensburg, they had uh, companies come in and look at the HVAC systems, which seemed to help uh, some of those concerns. But I think the, you know, for anybody who's in a face-to-face -face situation, and if you don't know if testing is happening, and you don't know if contact tracing is happening, um, I think those are the things we're trying to make sure there's something in place to do those uh, those basic things. Jamie, do you know uh, if in fact uh, the chancellor uh, has a sort of a, a regular um, sort of meeting online with the presidents of all the 14 universities and if they're sharing um, information with one another and tips on how to proceed um, best in this situation? Uh, I am certain that he does have regular meetings with the presidents, and I think he probably has meetings with the individual presidents at some of the campuses where there are uh, concerns. Um, at Bloomsburg, they do have a dashboard that's showing the number of cases among uh, employees and students. I saw a similar one at IUP, but, you know, I was concerned, and I don't know that this has happened, that maybe the Office of the Chancellor is giving guidance about here's what you need to report. Uh, that you need to let at least the campus community know if there are positive cases and, um, you know, either among faculty, employees, or students. Um, and that would at least, I think, give some people reassurance that if there aren't a lot of cases, that maybe we're doing things right. And if we start to see some kind of exponential growth, then what are we going to do to respond to, to that, level of, that level of COVID on campus? Mm -hmm. How's the infrastructure from an online teaching perspective across all of the 14 state owns? Uh, are you talking about the, the uh, technology parts yeah, of it? Yeah, technology, the online ability, the, the capability to even teach online. You, you know, this is interesting because um, Westchester made the decision early to go uh, fully remote, as they did at East Stroudsburg. And that gives the faculty enough time to plan uh, for that kind of uh, approach. Some of the universities had workshops um, and, and different things this uh, summer on campus to assist faculty with using technology. But if you have the opportunity to plan to do it that way, I mean, um, as opposed to I'm um, planning to do a face-to-face -face class and have to shift very quickly, that can make it more difficult as uh, Charlie might be able to attest to. So we haven't, in, we haven't heard um, any issues as of yet that there are you know, problems um, and the universities did install a lot of technology um, on the campuses and OWL cameras that allow for uh, students to be able to zoom in. Uh, so we're, we're hopeful that that's going to go uh, more smoothly now that at some campuses they've had the time to plan for that kind of uh, a medium for the classes. Jamie, uh, not uh, all of our viewers might have been with us last time. And I wondered if you could just go back for just a minute and give uh, everyone a recapitulation of the findings of the survey that ABSCUF did of uh, the faculty for the state universities and uh, how that uh, was helpful to us. Uh, sure, we, we did a, a large survey um, and we had a 67% response rate from our faculty with about 3,200 faculty responding. I mean, what were, what, the, the reason for that was I was receiving emails from faculty telling me that they were concerned, but we wanted to see if the concern was more widespread, and it was. Um, and most of the faculty, about 70%, said they had concerns about going back into the classroom for face-to-face -face, uh, uh, face -face classes, in part because uh, nearly 40% had some type of underlying condition that would put them at increased risk uh, for developing a serious illness if they were to come into contact. And, and half of them lived with family members uh, who were also at increased risk. So it was the concern about, am I going to take this virus home to my family? 
Um, and is some, am I going to get sick or would my family get sick? And then the, the other, the reason, the things that were driving that fear were exactly what's happening. They had fears that students, while they might use masks on campus or in class, that when they were in their residence halls or uh, off campus housing, that they wouldn't wear masks, that they wouldn't socially distance and that they would be gathering in large groups uh, the way that students do. And then the concerns about having enough um, uh, protective equipment, so masks, uh, plexiglass uh, between students and faculty, um, and all of the things that would happen in a classroom, and even cleaning. You know, so in some of the campuses, the, the protocol was going to be that the students would clean their desk area or lab area before or after they were leaving. Um, and as I've said repeatedly, we raised two sons, and I didn't think that was probably going to happen, that the students are going to be cleaning up after themselves. So all of those were the, the major findings and the major concerns. And, and the, we, we had some open-ended questions. And one of the ones that stood out to me was a faculty member who said, I would feel safer if I knew I had my students in my classroom and can kind of control that environment. But I don't know who's been in the classroom before me, uh, who's coming in after me. And so I don't have that kind of uh, control to make sure things are, you know, sanitary and clean. So there are those kinds of concerns as well. If you're walking into a classroom and have no idea what's, what, you know, who is there before, um, or for faculty who had to spend four hours in a lab and exposed to students for that length of time or teach in the same classroom for a three or four hour period. So those are the major concerns. And again, unfortunately, uh, we're beginning to see exactly the concerns that were voiced actually begin to occur. Do you think that a lot of the presidents, or at least some of the presidents, took the survey results to heart uh, when they made their decisions to remain online? Or, are, you know, did you, did you think they paid any attention to the survey results? Because they're pretty compelling what the professors and the teachers would like to see happen. I think that they probably did have some impact. We, we were able to speak with reporters. Uh, we did get those, uh, the, the findings uh, circulated. I spoke about it at the Board of Governors a couple of times and the university presidents are in attendance there. So I think, I'm hoping that that did have an impact that there, you know, there were uh, legitimate fears and concerns. I mean, I do think some of the, some of the presidents heard those concerns um, and recognized we're, this is one semester. Right. We have a lot of semesters coming up after this one. Jamie, in the last a minute and a half, could you tell our viewers what ABSCUF uh, hopes to do uh, in the th during the rest of this semester and for the uh, next semester in terms of uh, dealing with the uh, with COVID nineteen? Well, I, again, I am hoping that at the universities where they've brought back um, a sizable number of students. That they're, that they're able to be nimble in as much as they're following what's happening um, on their particular campus. And we're, we are clearly watching that to see uh, what, what is happening in terms of students becoming ill or faculty and, and staff. Uh, so I think they have to be nimble in responding um, and, not, and not wait until we get to a point where we have 89 cases in a, you know, a 10 day period. And Charlie, there's one other big issue going on for us in that we have, we're facing um, retrenchment at 10 of our universities. Um, and we're very concerned about that. So maybe it's something I'd like to find myself back on your show to talk about as we get into, in, uh, move into the, the fall semester. But um, we- there, There's a clear link in between this retrenchment, uh, possible retrenchment action and the COVID-19 as well, isn't sure. there? There is, but I think safety has to come first. Uh, certainly the safety and health of our students and uh, our staff and employees and our faculty, uh, but certainly there, there could be a link, but I, you know, there, I think there are ways to uh, work together to resolve this as opposed to having it become um, a battle between the faculty and the state system. So at some point, I'd like to come back and talk with you about that. We'd love to have you, Jamie. Uh, we want to thank you very much for joining us today and sharing uh, this information with our viewers. And we look forward to having you back uh, because this is a very important ongoing story.
Uh, Samara and I look forward to that time. We'll be right back here with another segment of Behind the Headlines after this. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors, the largest, most influential municipal association in the Commonwealth. Since 1921, PSATS has been preserving and strengthening township government and securing greater visibility and involvement for townships in the state and federal political arenas. Covering 95% of Pennsylvania's land mass, townships represent 5.5 million residents, more than any other type of political subdivision in Pennsylvania. Behind the Headlines is also brought to you by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. The Pennsylvania Chamber serves as the frontline advocate for business on Pennsylvania's Capitol Hill by influencing the legislative, regulatory, and judicial branches of state government. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Hi, welcome back to Behind the Headlines. On this segment of uh, our show, Maura and I are joined by Bob Latham, uh, who is the Executive Vice President of the Associated Pennsylvania Constructors. Uh, Bob, uh, it's very uh, a good time to have you on because in the summertime, we're used to uh, the roads and the highways of Pennsylvania being repaired uh, and new roads being built. And in this particular uh, year, this is a year like none, none other, uh, having to deal with everyone having to deal with COVID-19. Um, what is, uh, how is that affecting uh, the uh, road construction and the road crews uh, and your association? Sure, Charlie and Mara, good to be with you again today. Um, well, like everybody else, uh, road construction has, has been impacted by the whole COVID situation. Uh, Pennsylvania was the only state in the country to shut down projects uh, in an effort to promote safety uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so we lost about six weeks worth of work. Uh, what we were able to do is finally restart some of those projects on a, on a, on a slow roll uh, a restart. Uh, in many cases, we've made up the, uh, the schedule. Uh, in some cases, the, dry, you know, the, the sort of decrease in driving uh, in the early stages of the pandemic allowed us to, uh, uh, to, to work, uh, you know, during holidays and weekends and things like that in order to, in order to make up the schedule. So we would be, uh, have as little disruptive, uh, nature to the, to the citizens as possible. So we're muddling through, um, the main prob problem we're seeing right now is funding. And, uh, and we can talk about a little bit about that. Obviously, COVID has Im impacted PennDOT's funding and the Turnpike uh, uh, toll revenue as well. So funding, we keep coming back to it all the time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the issue that won't go away. <laughs> so it won't go, it won't go away. Um, Act 89, 89 of 2013 was billed as one of the biggest um, solutions. It was used as a model across the country uh, in other states, and but we're still we're still talking about funding. Can you explain why Act 89 wasn't enough? What what what? Where are we now with all of this funding? Well, hard to believe it's been seven years since Act 89 was passed. Um, so we're almost finished with what we call the decade of investment which was a result of Act 89. Now, uh, understand we identified about three and a half billion dollars annually of unmet needs prior to passage of that. Uh, Act 89 raised roughly two and a half or a billion a year or about two thirds of the, of the identified needs across the board in, in highway transit and other modes of transportation. So what happened right off the bat, unfortunately, was that uh, both the Corbett and, and Wolf administration, working with the General Assembly, decided to siphon um, about $170 million a year off of, off of uh, Act 89 uh, to the general fund uh, for the state police budget. That's been slowly whittled down. 
Um, but that, of course, has a tremendous impact. If you, uh, you know, do the math, 170 million times seven years, that's a lot of projects that could have gotten done that, that, that has not. Uh, secondly, um, we had anticipated a robust federal uh, uh, participation uh, that would sort of back and fill the last third. That never happened. We're still waiting. You know, the federal government has, while there's been minor increases in, in highway funding over the years, uh, and has not done a robust infrastructure bill for some 20, 20 25 years. So no action at the, at the national level. And finally, uh, simple inflation uh, eating into into the uh, uh, the funding mechanism, which is basically a, a, a static uh, percentage of uh, of the wholesale price of fuel. So, so inflation, uh, budgetary maneuvering by the General Assembly and two administrations, and lack of federal funds, have us right back in the soup here, if you will. And I throw on top of that the pandemic, uh, which uh, you know in the months of may and april of this year we lost we were down about 160 million dollars in in revenues to what they call the highway fund or the motor license fund here in pennsylvania um it is anticipated that uh, you know that, that that's going to have a greater impact uh, the budget office is telling PennDOT it's looking more like you know, a $400 million a year impact over these two fiscal years. So it's, a, you know, it, it's been a, uh, a very challenging situation right now. There's a lot of uncertainty as far as road projects going forward. Well, Bob, could you please tell our viewers how the pandemic would result in fewer funds uh, for the motor license fund? How does the, uh, the, the presence of this virus translate into fewer dollars uh, in the uh, in the till, certainly. So, uh, in the very short term, at the, uh, in April and May, we shut the entire economy down. And when people were told told to stay home and don't go anywhere, they don't drive. And as a result of not driving, there's no fuel consumption, and we have a con fuel consumption based tax, which pays for roads. So, basically, lack of a uh, of purchase of gasoline and lack of of tax revenues as a result of that. That's 160 million I talked about. Down the road, although we're seeing a rebound in traffic, a lot of, you know, particularly in, in commercial traffic, uh, we anticipate about a 15% a, a, a reduction in, uh, in passenger vehicle travel off into the future. Uh, so the budget, the budget office is looking at that, that and projecting that loss of revenue in, in that fashion. And while that is all going on, you know, while we're seeing that reduction in, in revenues into the future, we also have a, a non-static, if you will, uh, taxing structure so that as inflation at about two and a, two, two and a half percent a year uh, eats into buying power, um, there's less and less that can be done. So essentially the short-term impact by the uh, shutdown uh, long-term impact by people working from home and not traveling like they have uh, and inflation are, are eating into revenues. So before we get into how are we going to fix this, <laughs> um, I, I'd really like to know how are um, all of our construction workers doing on our roads? Are they safe? Are they healthy? Um, are they abiding by protocols? H how, how is everybody doing? Yeah, well, we would like to commend the, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and the uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission uh, officials and, and engineering staff, along with our industry. Um, <coughs> we work very closely as an industry and as an organization to immediately implement uh, COVID safety procedures on all of our projects. In fact, uh, we continue, uh, you will see as you drive by sites, uh, in some cases, while they're the only time that anybody is not wearing a mask is if they are socially distanced uh, and outdoors. Uh, we have mask policy. We have extensive cleaning of, uh, and sanitary facilities. Uh, we have extensive procedures in place uh, should there be a, a positive test for COVID as to what to do, how that impacts the project. So, yes, our, our people are very safe. Safety is the number one uh, goal of, of all of our members. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Well, and Bob, the, uh, we've talked also about the development of the Real ID. Uh, could you tell our viewers how the Real ID has affected this uh, situation as well? Yeah, certainly. We had uh, um, a number of things that have impacted funding along the way. Real ID is one of them. This was the, uh, 
uh, what we call a homeland security measure where the Department of Transportation has had to invest in new motor license uh, centers to the tune of about $150 million over, over a five year period of time. So again, you know, sort of these drips and drabs of, of, uh, of, of, of costs incurred are impacting funding as well. Uh, so when you go to get, go to those new license centers for, uh, to get your real ID, uh, all sorts of security measures have been built into the, those buildings. It's not just putting up some bricks and mortar. It, uh, there are specifications that are uh, very complicated for those buildings for, for uh, cyber security reasons. Uh, and all that cost has been put over onto PennDOT, onto the motor license fund. Uh, as a result of the requirement for real ID. So we've talked about the siphoning off of the money um, many for many episodes with you on uh, off to the state police. I mean, maybe now it will begin to be um, taken seriously, the impact that that has had. Um, so tell us what else is under consideration or what APC is proposing we do in order to fill in this uh, funding gap. Certainly. So the, uh, uh, the General Assembly passed uh, PennDOT's uh, full fiscal year 2021 budget, uh, as well as the Department of Education. The rest of the general fund right now uh, is sort of in limbo. And, uh, and we're recommending uh, that in order to make up this shortfall, uh, while we are appreciative of the, of the moves that the uh, Wolf Administration and the General Assembly has done to sort of uh, slowly uh, peel, claw back, if you will, some of the monies from the general fund to the motor license fund. Uh, we've seen a reduction of some $30 million of that, of that uh, uh, obligation, if you will, over the last several years. Uh, I don't want to uh, downplay those efforts, um, but if we're going to get at, at really what the needs are for fixing our interstates, the needs for fixing our local roads, uh, our uh, fixing the situation that has been caused for PennDOT with the pandemic. Uh, we need to rip the Band-Aid off right away. So as we're fixing the general funds $3 billion program, we think we, we suggest we throw the $700 million uh, that's coming out of the motor license fund into that mix and let highway users uh, see the benefits of the money that they're paying into the, into the highway fund through their gas taxes. Right now, about nine to 10 cents a gallon of your gas taxes uh, are going into the general fund, uh, you know, to pay for security and and uh, uh, of the and the operations of the state police. Most of which I'm sorry, we're got to a situation again where we run out of time. We always have more information than we have time. Uh, we appreciate you being with us again, and we will have you come back very soon so we can uh, update the situation and uh, see how things are progressing. But uh, for Mara and me, we just want to uh, say uh, we hope you'll come back again next week and uh, spend time with us on Behind the Headlines. We'll see you then.